Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Don C. I'm an alcoholic, and I am a member of the Mohican Nation. I was born for the Turtle Clan on my mother's side. I was born for the Coyote Clan on my father's side, and my Indian name is Tantanka Wambli. That was given to me by the Lakota elders when I was made keeper of the sacred hoop. But of all those uh, names, the one that I have to put on top, that's that I'm an alcoholic. I can never forget what that one is. You taught me that. Um, Wow, there's a lot of people here. (laughs) It's big. Um, Before I start, I was uh, would ask Tom if he would um, give this tobacco to Howard and uh, his the elder. And by offering that tobacco, I ask his permission to speak and to uh, share my story uh, tonight. That's how we do it back home. Is um, is always uh, uh, offer that to the to the elders and ask their permission. Um, we also uh, have another thing that the elders always tell us to do. They say that when people gather together, the first thing that you should do is to take the time to connect with each other. And then we become like one mind. And um, that's a, I guess that's why in our 12 steps it says we, because it's, don't say I, it says we. We're all in this together. And um, when I say the word connect with each other, uh, what I mean is this. If I were to switch and start speaking in my native language, what I'm going to say next would be very easy to say because in our our language, um, it has the ability to describe a lot about the spiritual world. And when we say uh, connect with each other, there's a word that we have for that. It's called netashneha. And what it means is, um, you know, it's like when when two eyes meet, then there's a second later, there's a feeling goes across. And when that feeling is there, then you nod your head or you um, uh, smile. Well, there's a feeling. So the elders say, never start until that feeling is there, that that connectedness is there. I don't know if you've ever been married to someone or maybe dated somebody, but they'll be looking right at you with their eye. And when you're speaking to them, that feeling is not there. And you can tell when it's not there. You feel like they're not listening. Then sometimes you'll even challenge them. You'll say, you're not listening to me. Oh, yes, I am. (laughs) Well, what I say then? (laughs) Then they can't remember what you said. (laughs) So they say, take that time to connect with each other. And that's how we were taught um, to do that. And um, how we do that is, um, I'm going to, um, and I guess this is to help me too, is I'm going to light some sage, just a little bit of sage. And uh, first we put down these four collars, red, yellow, black, and white. And um, what that is to remind us when we connect with each other that the Creator only made one race, didn't make four races, just made one race, and that's the human race. Just like they made flowers, different color flowers, you know, birds, different color birds, so that when each one of us humans are born, then the Creator gives to us an earth suit. That's all this is. This is just the suit. And then uh, we walk around the earth on that. But this outside, this isn't who I am, and you taught me that. It's inside. And so as we look around, we see our brothers and sisters from the four directions, and, and we ask to connect at our heart level. And uh, how we do that is, um, I'm going to light just a little bit of sage. And in our culture, we're taught that um, every plant has a medicine. Pharmaceutical companies, they know this too. If they find that plant, they can make a lot of money if they can find that <laughs> that has that medicine. The sage plant, what it does is it helps that connectedness to take place. You know, that's how, uh, that's how we are taught. It's called smudging. 
So I'm going to light just a little bit of this sage, and I only light a little bit because sometimes when you mix tradition and technology, it's always up there somewhere. <laughs> we have to be uh, respectful to each other. <laughs> then uh, we take our eagle feather, and then in that smoke, that medicine, it sticks to the feather. So we put that in there, and then you take it and you throw it, and it'll go way to the back of the room. And so this is how we're taught before we start to um, to help us all to connect with each other. Put that there. And then the elders, they tell us that whenever you are um, holding an eagle feather or you are in the presence of an eagle feather, they say you can't lie. So uh, I'm going to set it right there because I'm an alcoholic, you know, and... Uh, <laughs> So I'll put it right there. <laughs> well, one of the things that uh, you taught me out of many things is um, whenever I'm to do this is to share my experience, strength, and hope and to tell what it was like and what happened and, uh, and how it is now. And um, I know that uh, if I can just stick to that, I'll do really well. If I vary from that, then I'll, I'll be in trouble. So that's what I'll try to do, is, um, is to tell you that story. And maybe the best way I could tell you that story is to tell you a story that I heard when I first come into, uh, into AA. And it was one of the f things that I heard that just really resonated inside of myself. And uh, this guy told a story, he said... Um, there was this arena, and in this arena there was a, looks like a boxing arena. And uh, on one corner there was this person in the black trunk, snapped. his name was Alcohol. And then in the other corner there was a person that was me. And uh, we were in this arena, me and Alcohol. And there was a lot of people was in there, the arena, watching. They come to watch. And then you know how they always do this? Uh, in the very front row, they put a little barricade there, and they save that room for your family or your loved ones so they can sit right in the front row because they want them to have those special seats so they can get the best view. And so I wasn't long. My family came in, and they sat right down there in that front row so they could see. And then the referee called me an alcohol out there, and... Uh, Explain some rules. He said, there's rules. And so uh, he explained to us the rules, and uh, we both agreed to those rules. No hitting below the belt, and there was all kinds of rules. And so uh, we hit our gloves like that, and we went and we sat down. And uh, so pretty soon the bell rang, and uh, me and the alcohol, we come out and we started doing it. And at first it was kind of fun. There was no one was getting hurt. We were dancing around, and boxing away at each other, and uh, alcohol seemed to be enjoying it, I was enjoying it, and uh, bell rung, we sit down, and uh, we just was looking at one another, both of us smiling. Then we got up there for that second round, we started dancing around, and uh, I don't know how he did it, but the alcohol snuck in a lucky punch, and it just kind of stung me really good, and it surprised me. And I, I looked at the alcohol, and he said, oh, that was just a lucky punch. He said, don't worry about it. And I didn't, because uh, when I sized it up, I had all the confidence in the world who was going to win that fight, and I knew it was going to be me. And so we danced around there, and sit down, bell around, we come back out, danced around, and this time alcohol snuck a couple of punches in, and uh, I was surprised by it. But alcohol said, don't worry about it, he said, you can whip me. And inside, I knew that I could, I had that feeling when it come down to it, because I hadn't used all my stuff yet. I had some stuff in reserve that alcohol didn't know about. So this time I noticed uh, when I sat down after that bell rang, I noticed people started to leave. And uh, I just kind of caught that out the corner of my eye. And I think they, uh, it was getting kind of boring what was going on there. But my family didn't. They were sitting right in the front row and they were watching. And by the time we got to the sixth and seventh round, 
that alcohol is uh, doing that whenever it wants. It's just stinging. I started to get a bloody eye and started to ache a lot a bit. And each time the alcohol would throw that punch, it seemed to be worse. And they kept telling me, you can whip me. And uh, inside of myself, I, I knew that that was true. I knew that I could. And so we sit down after that round and... Uh, they were putting water and stuff, you know, on to heal me. And uh, pretty soon I felt this tug on my arm. And it was my son. And he come up and he said, Mom wants you to just come with us. She said, let's just go home. Just get out of there. But come home with us. And I looked down at my son and I said, You tell your mama just one more round. I got some tricks I'm going to. I'm going to use them. You, you sit there and you tell her to watch. And so that bell rang and we got out there and it was the other way. Alcohol had some tricks and it used. And uh, by this time my knees was all wobbly and uh, I was really hurting. And so the, I was glad that bell rang because I come set back down there and uh, I was sizing the alcohol up. That's all I was looking at, just looking at the alcohol. And pretty soon I felt this tug on my arm. And I looked down there, and it was my daughter. And I said, what? And she says, Mama says, if you don't come with us, we're going to leave. And I said, you tell your mama just one more round. I said, I, I got a trick. Just tell her to watch. And so that bell rang, and I got out there with alcohol again. And I'm not sure I, I, I remember when they left. I, I don't know. But they, they did go. What she said she was going to do, she did. And I always am grateful that I didn't know it at the time, but she was an Al-Anon. And Al-Anon taught her some things that she really, really needed to know to love me in a way that she couldn't do that on her own. And between a creator and uh, what she learned at Al-Anon saved my life. And so I have great respect for uh, for Al-Anon that they are doing what they are doing and, and helping so many of us. And so by the time I got to the last rounds there, I was on my hands and knees. When that bell would ring, I'd crawl out there and that alcohol wasn't following the rules anymore. Stomping and kicking my head and doing all those things that we initially agreed that neither one of us would do to each other. The alcohol was doing it. And it was screaming down to me, you can whip me. And even on my hands and knees, I had that feeling inside that I could. That's what my thoughts were. And that last round, I was crawling out on my stomach out there. And all I could see is the alcohol, the, the tenor shoes. I couldn't even see the rest of it. And so it was there that I finally figured out that the alcohol was lying. And so I crawled out of that arena. And I, I left there. And there was no one in that arena except me and alcohol. Everybody else was gone. So anyway, I got out there and uh, wouldn't you know, I started to heal up a little bit. And I remember this one day I got thinking. I said, you know something? I know, some, I know another trick. <laughs> so I put on my tenor shoes and I went back in that place where the alcohol was. And there the alcohol was standing there in the corner with his arms on those ropes, big old smile on his face. And I said, alcohol, I'm back. And he said, I knew you would be. He said, I knew you'd be. I've been waiting for you because you, you can whip me. you got a secret trick. And I said, yes, sir, I do. And so I walked in that arena, and he didn't even let me in the ropes. He was supposed to let you in the ropes. He didn't do that. I immediately got trounced right down on my knees again and so I crawl out of there and uh, I was really wounded that time again would you know I would get thinking after a little while you know I know one more trick it's a kind of a secret maneuver I think I could go in there and I'll, uh, I'll whip that alcohol so I walk back in there and uh, wouldn't you know the alcohol would be standing right there Big smile on his face. He said, alcohol, I'm back. And he said, I knew you would be. And you know what happened. So I left that arena 
And the last time I was in that arena was August 10th, 1978. I have, uh, <laughs> but it was then that I came to you. And um, I remember the first AA meeting I went to. It was actually in Colorado Springs, the first one, although I sobered up in York Street. But I went down in the afternoon, and I, I found where that meeting was. I didn't tell nobody I was going. It was none of nobody's business. But I went down, and I knew the address where it was. And so that night, the meeting started at 8 o'clock. I come down there about 10 minutes to 8. And as I drove in front of that meeting place, uh, those cars, they parked at an angle there. And there was one slot right in front of that door. And I drove by there really slow, and I said, I'm going to drive around that block one time. If that spot is there, then I'm going to go on in there. So I drove around that block, and I come back. And there were people, you know, coming and going to that meeting. Wouldn't you know that spot was right there? <laughs> I slowed way down, and I said to myself, I'm going to go around that block one more time. <clears throat> That spot is there, I'm going to go in. So I drove real slow as my old car would go. I drove around that darn block, and would you know that spot was in there? So I pulled in there, and uh, I didn't know much about AA. I knew that that's where you had to go. And so I, I went in that room, and uh, my first thing, my first comment about AA was, I says, oh, my God, they're all white people. I just looked, it's all white people. At that time, I learned later on how prejudiced I was. It had nothing to do with your earth suit, it was me. And so I sat in that meeting, and uh, when they go around, they say, my name's Don, I'm alcoholic. I wouldn't say nothing. It wasn't none of their business. And so they go around, you know, and they waited, and then I didn't say anything. They just went right on by, just like it was uh, Okay. And I don't really remember a lot what was said about that meeting, but I did have some opinions that I remembered. One thing I did not like about AA was how they talked about themselves, about the dishonest and being selfish and judgmental. And I thought, man, what's the matter with these guys talking like that? They were like telling on themselves. I would never tell nobody nothing. <laughs> and the other thing that really bothered me a lot about that first meeting was they laughed, and they laughed, and they laughed. And now there was nothing funny that I could see <laughs> about life. But they were just laughing. But the third thing that I remember that I didn't know until much later on was a feeling. And I didn't know what that feeling was. There was something that I never felt before that was in there, even though I was judging it as being negative. There was a thing there. Later on, I was to find out that's what it feels like when you come home. That's what that feels like. This is where I belong. But I didn't know that at first. And so uh, I came back, and uh, that last time I was out, when I come back, I had no resistance to AA. I didn't have all those, I won't get a sponsor and I can do this. No, no. I have none of that. When I come back, alcohol wielded me willing. I was willing when I come back in. And by then I had gone enough to know that one of the things I needed to do was to be willing to get a sponsor. I wasn't willing to do that before. And the guy that I asked to be my sponsor was a white guy, would you know? And I asked him, after that meeting, if he would be my sponsor. And he said, well, let's just talk about that. So uh, by then I was up at York Street in uh, Denver. And uh, we sat down at this table, have a cup of coffee, and uh, my sponsor's about uh, 6'5", I think, his big, a lot of scars. He's a real, you don't wonder if he's an alcoholic. He's an uh, alcoholic. <laughs> There's no doubt that he belongs in here. <laughs> and uh, we started off this relationship. It took about 15 seconds, and I realized I'm not going to like this guy at all <laughs> because he had a way of uh, looking at you like 
sarcastically or like putting down on you. That's how I felt, how he looked at me. And he'd size me up, you know, shake his head like that and old squinty eyes. And uh, and uh, he said, uh, he said, you know, he said, uh, he said, I watch you Indians. He said, I've been sober 18 years or what it was at that time. He said, I watch you. You come and you go. He said, you always sit way in the back. Sit there with your arms crossed. He says, look at it, and you don't say nothing. And he said, maybe a couple of minutes before the meeting ends, zip out the door, you go. He says, the best of you will stick around about maybe two months. He says, for the most part, he said, you guys just don't make it. He said, you're just really weird. He says, there's this <laughs> something wrong with you. And I remember, you remember like when you were a little kid or something, maybe I remember one time like uh, you got a puppy. You know, and you used to tease that puppy like you'd just rub its face like that and just rub its face, you know, how you, and you get him to growl. That's how I felt he was doing with me. He was like, <laughs> you're not going to make it, and you guys are going to do this. And I remember I just looked him right in the eye, but I didn't say anything out loud, but I, inside I thought to myself, I said, you know, you white son of a bitch, I'll throw you, I'll make it. You just watch, I'm going <laughs> to do it, see. But later on, I, I found out about the only thing he had to work with was my anger and my hate. I didn't have a lot of other tools for him to use, and he spotted that right away, if he could kind of keep me mad. And he didn't care that I was mad at him, that maybe I would do it. And then he told me, he said, this is how we work together. He says, we work together because we both want to. He says, suppose one day I see your hair is parted, and I don't like it, I don't want to work with you. He says, we work together because we want to. He says, supposing something about me you don't like, you don't even need to tell me, just don't show up. He says, we work together because we both want to. Then he grabbed that big book of AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, and he opened it up and he showed me how thick 164 pages were. And he said, if you do what it says, Exactly. In those 164 pages, he says, you will never have to drink again. And uh, that really struck me to hear that there was something that I could do to never drink again. Because I knew the other things that I tried, none of that worked. And I, I wasn't even sure if he was telling me the truth, but it was that hope that if there's something I could do, because the alcohol, it took everything. And I was doing crazy, crazy stuff, you know, by then. And so then uh, he told me, he said, uh, I'll tell you some things I'm not, he said, as a sponsor. He said, first of all, he said, I ain't your taxi cab. <laughs> He said, I ain't your banker. Don't borrow money from me. Don't be asking me for a ride. He said, you made it to the bars. You can make it to meetings. And he told me all these things. It was what he was not. But he said, one of the things he said, I'll, I will guarantee you, said, I'll be your friend. And then uh, he thought about that. And he said, as of right now, I'm your friend. He said, I don't care whether you like me or not. He said, I had just decided I am going to be your friend. <laughs> And ain't nothing you can do to change it in any other way. <laughs> then he went on and he said, there's some things that I can, uh, I'll give you. He said, one thing I can give you is hope. He said, because I know something you don't. He said, I know how to stay sober. And he said, you, you little brown son of a bitch. He said, you know nothing about staying sober. <laughs> he said, I know something you don't know. You know, just like, you know, just rubbing my face like that. So then he opened up that big book and he um, he showed me these 12 steps. And he said, before we, he called it the step before the step. And he said, I want you to look at each one of these 12 proposals and you're to ask yourself two questions. One, he says, you read step one. And then you ask yourself, do you want to do it? Then he said, the second question you ask is, are you willing to go at any length to work that step? 
And you're to answer those two questions with all 12 of those. And I remember when he was telling me that, I was over at his house, and he was making us a sandwich, you know, and um, we were just eating. He was just talking like that, and uh, he knew that I liked uh, peanut butter, because, uh, you know, and I was, he, he was making me a peanut butter sandwich, and he was telling me about about the AA. He said, it's like a banquet, he said. On one end, there's like steak and lobster on that, you know. You could have that kind of sobriety, and then further down, there's like meatloaf, and then just cheeseburgers, and he... He was coming all the way down, and I had this, took this big bite out of this peanut butter sandwich, and he said, he said, there's even like peanut butter sobriety, he said. <laughs> but he said, oh, and I've got my mouth full, I can't say anything, you know, and he said, but the problem with peanut butter, he said, it sticks to the roof of your mouth, you know, you go. <laughs> and then later on, sometimes I see him sitting in a meeting, and you know, when you're in a meeting with your sponsor, like, they're trying to get your attention, you know, they're trying to connect to you, you can feel that, so you, you look the other way, you know, <laughs> trying to avoid that. And then finally, I looked at him, and I look at him, he'd look across me, he had this big old funny smile on his face, and he'd go. <laughs> just like, you know, just like, me. And then he took a meeting schedule from Denver, and he circled six meetings I was to attend. Traditions meeting, big book meeting, 12-step meeting, just one very specific discussion group where there was really long-term sobriety there. And he said, I want you to go to these meetings. He said, one night you can choose yourself. Sunday night was my freedom night. I could go to whatever meeting I wanted to, but I was to go to exactly these meetings and he said, you go there, and you just say, my name is Don, I'm an alcoholic. And he said, don't say nothing else, because nobody's got anything. Anything you say is of no value to anybody. He said, just shut up. Just say your name. Don, you're alcoholic. Don't talk. And so, uh, see, I was willing to do that. So I, I went to meetings. That's all I did for probably uh, five, six months. Until I took the third step, then I could talk. But I went to this meeting one night, and I sit down there, and who would walk in but this this Indian woman walked in. Oh, and she just looked so good to me. <laughs> and I, some of you don't know this, but there's a term we have in our native communities called snagging. It's like, <laughs> you know that one? Well, she was giving me that snagging look. I knew that she was. So she sat down right across the table, you know, that long, dark hair, and she's, I knew she's interested. I could tell. I was pretty sure. <laughs> so I was a little bit nervous there, and I thought, you know, I'm not going to make any impression on this Indian woman if I don't at least quote the book or something. i got to say something, you know. And here I was uh, under that guideline from my sponsor. So anyway, come my turn to speak, and I went for it. I quote in that big book, man made her smile. She probably thought I was like an old timer or something. <laughs> then we did work. We went for a cup of coffee afterwards, you know, just coffee. And then uh, <laughs> I went back to my apartment, and I was strutting. I was just feeling so good. I wasn't in my apartment. Fifteen seconds. Phone rings. <laughs> Guess who it was? It was Big Frank. What are you doing moving your lips tonight? <laughs> no. yeah. You know, the sponsors are there like that wireless internet or something. You know, they're, they're everywhere. They always find out, you know, that is, they always find out. But with his help, he got me into the big book of AA. I used to hear in meetings all the time about the instructions in the big book. They say all the instructions are in there. I never could see those instructions in that big book. Actually, that big book was the most boring book I ever read in my whole life, you know. <laughs> I couldn't see anything that was in there. But he told me, he said, if you are a real alcoholic, he said, you will understand that book. He said, if you're not an alcoholic, it'll just be like a book, but if it was written for someone with mind, was like mine. And so then he showed me the first 43 pages had to do with the uh, first half of step one. 
And I was instructed to read that 25 times. I had to read that because he said, your mind can't remember very much. So you got to read it again and again. And he called it a textbook and I was to study it. Then when we got to the second half of step one, he showed me on page 52 something he called the unmanageability paragraph. And it's a part where it says we're having problems with personal relationships. We couldn't control our emotional nature, full of fear. And he had me take those nine areas, take that sentence and turn it into a question. And so I had to take a look at my unmanageability in personal relationships. And I wasn't to look at what were they doing. I had to look at, say, at that time, I was, uh, say, married. Then I had to look at, he said, it's like a helicopter. You fly over this island, your personal relationship island, and you look down and you got to look at how are you acting. When something happens, what are you? Are you clamming up? Are you running? Are you attacking, building resentments, getting even, building IOU accounts? then getting even later. So he showed me how to look all at nine of those areas. Each one of those I had to look at, and that was the instructions that I had for the second half of step one. And it was the first time I was able to look at my life and how I was doing it. I didn't... I guess I had blamed everybody else so much, I didn't take a look at my part of it, of how I was in that relationship, and I could see why everything was screwed up it was the way that I I automatically reacted and reacted. Didn't even I didn't know no other way that I could see. So then he had me read that chapter to agnostics for step two. And then it was there, came to believe. And he explained to me what that means. He said, You don't have to believe it. You just gotta be willing to believe. Even if you're kinda willing to sort of believe. Or maybe you're possibly willing, momentarily, sometimes willing to kind of believe that any of those was enough to get that step going. And then he had me take those nine areas that I had in step one, and he had me build nine mini visions. I had to take a look at my personal relationships. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could. How do you think the creator? would have you be in relationships. Not how would he do it, not when would a creator do it, but what would that look like? And I was to build nine mini visions in that area. And uh, when I did that, got that done, and he told me what that means. He said the steps are not separate. They're all interconnected with each other. That's why you have to do them in order. And he said what you write out there in step two will be your spiritual awakening by the time you get to step 12. Because it says, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. And he taught me when I did that work in step 2 that the majority of that work would be beyond my belief system. It's not what I would believe, but like impossible or extraordinary like that. And so I took that step. And then he showed me the instructions in the big book on step three. Being convinced we were at step three. And in that area of the book, he believed that every sentence was an instruction. You didn't just read it. So when it said that your life run on self-propulsion, it wasn't just to read it, but I had to give him examples as we sat and talked about that, what that meant. I had to draw from my experience to say, this is me. And as I went through that, I began to see I was the actor and I was trying to run the show, even when I was being nice. And I had to go through the questions, I had to answer the questions, and I went all the way through that. But I did struggle some with step three because of this concept of a higher power of God because I was raised on a reservation and um, I went to the boarding school and uh, on the reservation, there were different churches come and gone. You know, that's kind of, they must get some bucks. And so they do a mission thing and they run out of money. Then they go and then the next one comes in. And and uh, a lot of times why we went there really was for the food and for the clothes. But the way they did it, you always had to hear the sermon first. And then you got to eat afterwards. You know, that was the deal. So it depended upon who was there, you know, like, 
certain of the ones would come there and we all had to be going like this and then uh they would go and the next ones would come in and we had to go like this, you know, and uh it was always uh it was that way. And uh, you know, we're just little kids, you know. And you know, when you're a little kid it's it's you, you know, it's not like when you're an adult, like a little kid you look at it differently. Like I went to a to mission school, you know, if you take a little say a little Indian boy and you look at a nun, that nun is huge. They're big. I mean, they're like, whoa, they're just really, really big. And uh, we was always scared of them, you know. And uh, what used to get me mixed up, you know, it was like uh, each one of them, they, they always talked about this hell. And uh, so the first ones that was there, they would say, the other ones are going to hell. But you got to belong to this one, then you go to heaven. Of course, zip, they will go away. And then the next ones would come in. And they say, oh, no, those are the ones that go into hell. This, you're in the right one now. See, you, you'll get in heaven. And it kind of mixes you up a little bit, you know, uh, <laughs> as a little kid, as I remember it. And uh, like they would say, like, uh, you ever been thirsty? Say, oh, yeah. There ain't no water in hell. <laughs> you get blisters on your tongue. And you're a little kid, you go, wow, wow, there's no water there, you know. <laughs> Has you ever been burnt? Been bur- Your whole body is going to blister all over it. And there ain't no water. So you say, you want to find God? You, you bet I do. <laughs> but it was like you had the flames of hell licking your ass, you know. To, I better <laughs> seek God, n- not because of God, but because I didn't want to go to hell. It wasn't until I come to you that I found out the incredible beauty of having the Creator in your life. You know, I, I, I learned a whole new way. So I had some problems with that third step. You know, I was trying to sort that out. You know how it is when you first come in and, well, heck, you can be in here a long time and it still can be that way, right? But I was in a meeting one time and I heard this guy tell his story and uh, this really helped me a lot. I don't know why it was, but the stories sometimes that the members told help clear things up. But he was set in this meeting one time, third step meeting, and he was saying, there was these four, four frogs sitting on a log, he said, on a, in a pond. Then he said, um, one of those frogs made a decision to jump in the water. So he said, how many frogs was left? And I said, well, three. He said, no, four. He said, that frog just decided to jump, but didn't do it. <laughs> He said, so that third step, what it means, when you make that decision to turn your life over, he said, what the Creator does is makes you an orange frog. So now there's three green frogs, and there's one orange frog sitting on that log. And he said, "Uh, you heard like, you hear people in AA, and um, they say, oh, I turned my life over, or I took it back. I turned it over, I took it back. See, that was mixing me up, because I thought, wow, you know, how does that all work? But he said to me, he said, let's just say that you become an orange frog, and what happens, you do it on Tuesday, then let's say on Friday, you have a blow-up, you get really upset. He said, you're just a pissed-off orange frog. <laughs> so. <laughs> then he said, what happens if the following Monday you go get drunk? How about that one? He said, when well, you're a drunk orange frog. He said, uh, And where I was, I went, duh, I get it, you know. That's what that thing means. Do I want to become that orange frog? So I went to to my sponsor, and uh, I made an appointment with him. And I made the mistake of, uh, uh, he said, well, how's it going? I said, well, Frank, I said, I want to become an orange frog. (laughs) Where in the big book does it talk about frogs, you know? So, (laughs) So anyway... So anyway, that night, me and that old man, we took that third step. We got on our knees and each held that big book, hung on hands. He read that third step prayer, and I read that third step prayer. And I don't, I didn't have no, no burning bush or something, but I just had this feeling. It was that same feeling like my first AA meeting I went to. That's the second time I felt that when I took that step with that man. I had no idea what it was. But it was a feeling. So then I asked him, I said, what next? Well, he reached behind his chair and he pulled out a tablet, tablet and a ruler and a pencil. 
And before I left there, he had showed me how to write inventory. And he showed me how to write a five-column resentment inventory. I wrote a four-column fear inventory and a 11-column sex inventory. <laughs> and um, why 11 columns? You know how it says you were dishonest or unjustifiably? Each one of those had to be in a column so I could see the pattern. Is to not mix them up so I could look at dishonesty all the way through, selfishness all the way through. It was just a way of, of seeing better. And so he did explain to me in that book where he talks about that everything has to be shared. Every secret that you have, it has to be told when you come to the fifth step. So I remember I went home and I was writing inventory. And um, this one Friday night, I was coming home from work. And my inventory was done, and I knew it was good. I knew there was everything that I could think of was in there one place or another. I knew that. The sick stuff. Legal stuff. If I got caught, all that was in there. Money that I stole, the six sexual things that I did, all that, it was in there. And so I was coming home that night from work, and uh, Freddie, and you know how you get that feeling? I knew I was going to either fifth step or drink. Many times I was motivated by alcohol, even the steps. I got that, you know how your wrists go like that, and you get that nervousness. And I could see my thinking just going like that, and I was scared. So I call him up, and uh, I found that they just take him to the hospital. And I called this other guy that I knew, and he went home. So I called this third guy. I kind of knew him. And uh, I didn't know how to ask him. You know, you don't know how to do that. If, to, to somebody who doesn't know, you know, that's not in that circle of, that you're doing the work with. But he picked up on it. He said, do you have to do a fifth step? And I said, yes, yeah, I, I really do. I said, it's really important. He says, come on over, I'll put the coffee on. So we went on over there. Well, what I didn't tell him was uh, I'd done everything like Frank said, except the dark crannies. I put them on different pieces of paper, the sick stuff. And so I got there, and I, I read everything that was there. And then uh, this man said, um, he says, well, is that it? And I said, well, oh, that's it. I said, that wasn't too bad. And so he said, well, let me make some more coffee. <laughs> so as he was making coffee, he started to tell me about some of the sick stuff that he had on his. Really, I mean, this man was really sick. <laughs> so then that kind of gave me this courage. I said, you know, I do have a few more pages of something I, I want to share with you. But I thought in my mind, you know, I thought I was afraid that he would tell. And some of that stuff I could get in trouble for. That's how I felt. But I remember thinking to myself, I said, okay, I'll tell him. But if he tells on me, I'll tell on him too, because he told me some stuff. <laughs> but little did I know to later on that he had the freedom he had the freedom to tell that, except I didn't know that. And so I told him everything that was in there. And so then he showed me in that big book that it says when you come home, there's some review that you need to do with the first five proposals. And so I went ahead and I did that. And then uh, for step six and seven, they showed me those columns where I was to get my character defects. And I was asked the creator to remove those defects. Now, remember when I started step six and seven? It seemed like every time I tried to do it, it got worse. It didn't get better. And so I thought I was doing it wrong. And uh, that's how it seemed to me. And then one time I was at a meeting on step six, and I heard this guy tell a story. Then it really helped me to understand this. But he told his story. He says, supposing that you're going to uh, build a cake. He said, you get the pan, you put the flour and sugar and vanilla and whatever in that pan, and he says, you turn on the stove, let it warm up to 350 or whatever. Then he says, when you get ready to put that cake in there, you take a spatula, you smooth that cake out, and he said, you got to open up the door, and then when you put that cake in the oven, you close the door, and you leave that door closed, because now the stove will build, will cook the cake. He said, what you're doing is, he says, it's like you put your character defects in there and then you open up the door to see what God's doing with it. And then you shut it back up and you open it up and when are you going to do it? You know, he said, you're trying to, and that's exactly what I was doing. You know, I was trying to, I didn't know the simplicity of it was, is you turn yourself that defect over to the creator, you put it in the oven and you let him bake it. Don't be peeking. 
And all of a sudden, I, uh, that made sense to me, what I was to do. And so uh, I went through it and I did that. And then I got to my amends, and my sponsor was very adamant about making those amends in person, wherever I could. If I had to drive, the first thing it was to make them in, in the person, if at all possible. And I did have some uh, that I had done. I didn't know where they were. And he knew about this library of telephone books in downtown Denver. I guess they got a telephone book of every city in the United States. So I had to go down there and search out and to find these people in order to make those amends. And eventually I got through those, uh, through those amends and I got in steps 10 and 11. And, uh, I had done, that's how I did steps 10 and 11 for three years. I'd open up to page 86 and I'd read it and close the book and say, I did it. So one time I was telling my sponsor about, he said, he said, he said, you know, you're, you're, you're yo-yoing. He said, well, how are you doing at step 11, 10? I told him. And he just rolls his eyes. He says, you know when it says you think about the 24 hours ahead? That's what you're supposed to do. Think about the 24 hours ahead. Not read it. you got to think about those 24 hours ahead. Then he says, you know that part where it says you consider your plans for the day? You just don't read it. you got to consider your plans for the day. And he said, that doesn't mean you consider your plans what you're going to do. He said, it means you consider your plans what you're going to be. Patient, kind, loving, like that. That's what I had to think of. Then it says, you ask God to divorce, to stay from three things. That was to say a prayer to the Creator. Remove these three things from this day. Don't let them show up. And so as I started to do what that book said, once again, I started to make progress. Things started to change. And so I got through those, that's my journey through the first 12 steps. But I also was sponsored to go through those steps every year. Not everybody does that, but that's how I was sponsored. Every year prior to my sobriety anniversary, just before that, I'm to go through that work again. When I got about four years sober, I guess within a period of a month or so, I went nuts. All of a sudden, meetings really sucked. And my sponsor was really stupid. And I, big book, I couldn't read it, and I didn't want to pray. And it was just, uh, I, I could see I wanted to withdraw, and I didn't want to be around people. And uh, I hated people saying, what's the matter? Nothing. Oh, yes, there is. I can tell, you know. You just hate it when they call your stuff. It was like that. So I was just really messed up. And, uh, you know, when you get a taste of this program, you can't sell for nothing less. You can't. Whatever you get, you can't go back to that old way. It was like that. And I was being miserable and sarcastic to people and putting them down. I was irritated. So I went up to see my friend Johnny Looking Cloud. He was a Lakota man. And so I went up to see him and uh, I was telling him, I said, you know, I'm losing it. I said, all this stuff, I it quit working. So he said, how long are you sober? And I said, so four years. Exactly. So I told him exactly. He says, ah, you're right on schedule. <laughs> then, you know, when you're in a bag of crap, the last thing you want to hear is somebody say, I like, God doesn't give you more than you can handle. I believe God does give you more than you can handle. That's why you panic, you know, or take it one day at a time. You know, you take it one day at a time. I'm in a crisis, you know, like that. <laughs> so what he explained to me, he said, Everything the Creator made travels in a circle or a cycle. The moon goes around the sun, on earth, the earth goes around, everything is like that. He said, we human beings, he said, we're just like everything else. He said, we travel in a four-year cycle. He said, just like an oak tree, when that spirit of that sap starts to flow in that tree, it starts to make it grow. Then you got one season that it buds. Then the second season, those buds unfold and the oak tree now has a shape. Then it goes into its third season and the oak tree is like fall. Very, very beautiful. Then in the next season, all the leaves go away. He said, that's how it is in recovery. Your first year is spring. Second year is summer. Third year is fall. Then he said, in that fourth year, he said, it looks like everything falls to crap, but it doesn't. That's just winter. All our beliefs and things, they lose their power, and we got to go through renewal. 
So he said that every four years when you go through a set of steps, you work them different than the first three. And what I remember, I was driving back to Colorado Springs where I live, and uh, I remember I started to cry. And I wasn't crying because something was wrong. See, I thought God was mad. I thought I was screwing up. I thought I did something wrong. And I didn't. It was just winter. So I experienced it at 7 to 8. And I experienced it again at 11 to 12. And I experienced it again 15 to 16. You know, it's just uh, something. So I, I, uh, I found out then to really go to meetings during that winter season. Really look at everything different. And so I went through like that. And eventually I could see I didn't have my life together at four, but it was better than when I was three. And I didn't have my life together when I was six, but it was better than when I was four. You know what I mean? I could look back and I could see it getting better, but I still always have a lot of work to do. But if I look back, I can see things were changing and things were getting better. And so then... uh I think I was about seven or eight years sober, it must have been, and uh, I took these 12 steps to uh, a group of elders, native elders. Some of them were traditional, some in recovery, and here in my arrogance, I, I went there for whatever reason. But I wanted to talk to them about these 12 steps. And so uh, I give them the tobacco and everything, and so I said, I want to talk to you about this white man's program. I said, it's like the 12 steps. And uh, they said, well, what are these, explain these 12 steps. The best that you can. So I explained them. And, uh, so then uh, when I got done, they said, oh, that's not a white man's program. They said, that's exactly how we do it. And so they explained this order that when you get off track about admitting powerlessness and unmanageability and, and then turning over to the Creator and examining yourself, they said, this is exactly how we do it. They said, this isn't a white man's program. This is our program also. They did say, though, they said, if we were to make a change, the only change I would make, they said, is we put these steps in a circle. And so they showed us how to put steps one, two, three in the east. That's like new sun, new day. That's the four directions. That's where you find your higher power. Then steps four, five, six in the south, the inventory, that's where you find yourself. You look at your strength and weaknesses. Now you know who you are, the good, the bad. Then in the west was steps seven, eight, and nine. That's where you make your amends. And that's where you find your relatives. When you go tell them, I'm sorry, I was wrong, you said it right, you find your, your, your relations, you establish back. And then 10, 11, 12 in the north, then that's the elder's wisdom, the maintenance and growth of that spiritual way. And that's how they taught. And so as we started to bring this to the elders, then they started to, to realize that our culture in this process of growing was not separate, they were the same. And so they taught us before we go through a set of steps to do a, 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 um, a staking ceremony. And we now take step three with the chinupa or the pipe. Fifth step in the sweat lodge. When you come out of that sweat lodge, you take your character defects and you make tobacco tie for each one of them. One for selfish, one for dishonest, one for judgmental, one for each one. Then you go back in that sweat lodge and then they sing the songs. Our songs are very powerful. And they're all there to support you. And when you sing that song, you take that tobacco tie and you offer it on those hot rocks to grandfathers. And you wait and you pray and they're singing. And all of a sudden, it'll just go, just burns into fire. And you just feel that defect, that character, something changes. And you put another one and you put another one. It's like you can't wait because you start to see that the Creator is taking that thing away from you. He's making those changes. So we started to learn we could do it in that manner. You know, uh, it wasn't separate. Then I started to understand, you know, what that was. When I was about um, 12 years sober, it was shortly after the white buffalo calf was born in Janesville, Wisconsin. The elders instructed us to build a hoop of 100 eagle feathers. And we're together, the elders from the spiritual, traditional, black, yellow, red, white. And I was instructed to build this hoop of a hundred eagle feathers and bring that hoop up by the white buffalo calf. And then the elders from the four directions, they did a ceremony. And they put into this hoop four powers, forgiving the unforgivable, 
The powers of unity, powers of healing, powers of hope. And when that was done, they did a ceremony to ask me to come be keeper of that sacred hoop. And when I found out what they were doing, I stopped the ceremony and I said, I can't do that. I said, you guys don't know. I said, I'm, I'm a drunk. I said, if you knew what, if you knew what was in here, you wouldn't give me the responsibility to keep a sacred hoop. But they said, we do know what's going on in there. There's good, there's things to work on. And so I eventually, I was given my Indian name and I was asked to take that sacred hoop around of a hundred eagle feathers. It may not mean something to you, but the responsibility and just the honor of being asked to do that from where I came was a very, very powerful experience. And so it was through that. Then uh, the next thing that happened was we started to work with Native communities. We started a movement called the Well Bridey Movement. Not so Bridey, but Well Bridey among our Indian nations. And uh, we got that word from uh, our language and then translated it into English. See, we didn't want to say a sobriety movement. We wanted to have a different word that had something more appropriate. See, if you're a jerk and you're drinking, you say you just quit drinking then. Now you're sober. But you're still a jerk. And so we wanted to call it more than that. So with the elders' help, we named it sobriety movement. And so then uh, that's what I have been doing, um, is taking the hoop around and... Um, helping the communities do that work with the medicine wheel and the 12 steps. And we added to that the cycle of life, medicine wheel teachings, and things that are meaningful to our culture, and to do it in that way. Sometimes I have to pinch myself um, that uh, from where I came that I am uh, uh, allowed to do some of the things I'm doing today. It's just, it's, uh, it's just such an honor you know, to be alive and it's not that it hasn't been perfect. You told me it wouldn't be perfect. But you did say, no matter what happened, I could stay, take, stay sober. That's true. A lot of stuff has happened. Um, you, were, you told me that no matter what goes on, that I would learn how to look at those, those, those things different. So I found that was true, too. No matter what goes on, there's a way that I can look at something different. And when I look at it different, then the thing that I'm looking at changes. You know, just like there's this magic to it, like with my children and stuff. When I started to look at my children as sacred beings instead of brats, <laughs> when I changed my mind, I started to look at them, then they changed. When I got to the point where I could start talk to the elders about how to look at women, not as sex objects and all of that, but sacred beings, the life giver. And I started to bring that into the steps that the way that the old people said, then all of a sudden they changed. They weren't the nags and all this other stuff that I was talking to them. I started to look at things different. You taught me that I could do that. When I first come in a program, uh, the first year I wasn't allowed to see my children. It was bad. The second year I was allowed to see them. But when I would go there, they say, hi, Dad, zip out the back door. And I never thought that I would be able to get that relationship back with them because they went through a real lot. You, some of you guys know what happens when it goes on. Christmas, the third year, was the first time I took them in a car and we took them for Christmas shopping. And I was in a car with them. And uh, we come back. I brought them home and uh, got up by the steps and... Uh, we were getting ready to part, and uh, my oldest son, he, he looked at me, and he said, Dad, and I, I, I look on him, and he's like, Mike is a big guy, you know, and uh, he, he's bigger than me, and uh, he said, Dad, I love you, and he gave me this hug, and I never thought, I never thought that would ever happen. Then my next son did, and, and my daughter did, and... um. I'm allowed these days, uh, whenever I want, I can go pick up my grandchildren and I take them for a weekend and I, I take them out and teach them cultural things and they don't call and check. There was a day that they said they would never allow that to happen. But that changed, you know, also. It all changed. And I find it continues to do that. 
It just continues to uh, to be okay. It continues to work. I'm going through a set of steps right now. And um, I sometimes think that the longer you're sober, the, the harder the work is, not easier. Um, I'll just kind of close with this. Uh, Johnny Looking Cloud, one time I went to his house, and he had this table, one of those narrow tables in front of his window, and he had these river rocks on there. They're real round rocks, flat, and he had them painted black and white on each side. And I always noticed it there, and I always thought, boy, someone just got those rocks there. And so uh, he told me, he said, uh, those big rocks, what they represent, the first time I went through the steps. He said, I turned all those big rocks. When I got it, he said, I turned them over. But then I realized they're smaller rocks. And I usually don't see those the first time through the steps, but now when I come back, the smaller rocks are now the bigger rocks. And so I went through that in that way that I always know that there's more things to look at, more things. Frank, my sponsor, this set of steps, he gave me something to look at, and I hate him again. <laughs> he said, I, what I want you to work on this time is something he called intentional neglect. And I said, what the heck is intentional neglect? And he said, oh, he said, that's that thing like you walked on your life, and it pops up, and you just go like that. You know, you know that one? It pops up, you just look the other way. See, if you see it and you wrestle with it, it's easy to write inventory on it because, you, you know, you justified whatever. But when it pops up, you just ignore it. And uh, what I found out is I, I have some of those, quite a few of those that I'm looking at. And I never thought that I had those things, it's little games, you know. And uh, sometimes when he helps me like this, like I'll tell him about something and he gives me little hints on how to look at things because sometimes it's harder to see. One time he told me, he said, just say the thing out loud that you don't want to say and say it. And another time he told me, why don't you just name the game you want to keep on playing? Just say, this is the name of the game I want to keep on playing. And it had a way of getting me unstuck. You know, it just pops up. And I just hate it when he does that to me because <laughs> things are going really fine before that. <laughs> but to me... Uh, in our culture, that when you experience something sacred, when it is uh, in your presence, you stand out of respect. That's how I feel if I would not cause uh, disruption in a group. When they read those 12 steps, that's what I would do. I would stand out of respect for those steps, for what they have done, and the power that they have to, to change something around from where I was in that boxing ring. And it continues, you know, to do that today. It's been very, very powerful. I think I would say this, if I were to uh, say the worst thing in the drinking years of all those things, if there was a list, the one that I would move to the top as the worst thing was the loneliness. You know, that hole, that, that thing. You do a lot of crazy things to make that feeling go away. I would say if I were to pick the most positive thing in my recovery, it would be the relationship that I have with uh, my creator. I call him the creator, or I say it in my language, but creator in English. Very common sense, practical. I have no fear of uh, God's will. That was a dumb fear. I had that for a long time, even in a program. But God's will, I, have, I don't have that fear. Actually, I don't experience much fear at all these days. I don't have a lot of fear. I had a lot of fear before because, you know, when you walk in harmony with that red road or that way, fear isn't a part of that. Um, one time when I was on my reservation and I was drinking, they asked me to don't come back here no more. They said, go away, you're trouble. And I was asked to not come back there. You guys was a little bit different when I messed up in that same way. What you said was keep coming back. <laughs> and by God, as crazy as this sound, I, I, you meant it. You wasn't kidding. I, I come to a meeting drunk. You take me to detox or someplace. And then I come back there and you were happy to see me. And uh, and never got tired of that. You were always there. So I guess I would just say this. If I had to be placed in a position of choosing between you and my tribe, I would choose you guys. 
That's who I would choose. I would choose you. So I'll close with this prayer. I heard this in AA too. Anything I know that is of any value, I learn from you guys. That's how it seems to me. But I heard this prayer one time, and it says, God, thank you for what you've given me. And it says, God, thank you for what you've taken from me. And God, thank you what you left me. And it's my fellowship with you and your willingness. When I'm off track, there's some of you in here love me enough to tell me. And that's what saves my life. Those of you, long-term sobriety don't mean nothing. It's that when you see me off track, you love me enough to tell me. And I, and I love you for that. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.